Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. If you could uh, kindly take your seats for the commencement of the uh, of the property law breakfast seminar. Uh, Michael Green's list has been conducting these seminars for the best part of seven years. That is to say, not just the property law series, but uh, many other series on uh, substantive law, ethics, uh, professional um, skills, and uh, the other areas that are relevant to uh, uh, professional development. Uh, the breakfast seminars have been going for less than seven years, something like five years, but I'm sure you'll all agree, those who've attended and who've heard about them, um, that they are by far the best of the uh, CPD uh, seminar series that are conducted uh, by the bar or within the bar or by any of the lists of the bar uh, and their success is demonstrated by the numbers of people that are uh, consistently attending these seminars. Um, today we have, uh, uh, as you're aware, a, a, uh, an emphasis on property law. Um, we've got two um, very able and eminent um, barristers in that field, John Warren and Bill Stark, and I'll be introdu introducing those uh, members of the bar shortly. Uh, but I want to firstly um, bring to your attention, if you don't already know it, that uh, Michael Green's list has uh, changed its format somewhat in very recent times. Um, so we would urge you to access Green's list via your um, uh, computers and in particular to uh, entertain the idea of, uh, indeed urge you to, to subscribe to the online library, uh, which is uh, a new feature of Michael Green's list. Um, it's an excellent development. Uh, it uh, has all the papers that are presented uh, in these seminars, whether it be property law as it is today or any other uh, field of substantive law. Uh, you're able to access the uh, not only past papers but the forthcoming 2011 uh, program. Uh, you're able to engage in uh, what we now know today as the, the blogging network. Uh, you can blog with barristers, with uh, other solicitors, and it's, um, uh, it will have a, an improved search functionality. So that it's, it really is... Uh, uh, a fully-fledged uh, online network uh, for people who want to be informed fully of uh, areas uh, relevant to their practice in terms, of, um, in terms of legal research. And I would urge you all to uh, make inquiries about uh, subscribing to the online, online library in particular. Uh, I should add that there's, uh, as, part of the, uh, as part of the introductory aspect of that, there'll be, uh, the list is offering one month's free access to the online library. So without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce John Warren. John uh, is a, a barrister of recent um, provenance. He was admitted to practice uh, in Victoria in 2007 and has been at the bar uh, since 2008. And significantly for today's topic, John uh, had um, quite some time experience with the title's office, so he's well and truly versed with the procedures and the, uh, the legal ramifications uh, of, uh, of property law and the operation of the Property Law Act, the Transfer of Land Act, and the other relevant legislation which touches upon the field. His specialty in terms of practice is and has always been in the field of property and equity and uh, retail tenancy. Um, today's paper will be addressing issues of co-ownership of property, uh, in particular the jurisdiction which is now conferred upon VCAT and when it is appropriate uh, to uh, use that jurisdiction uh, and when you're able to use that jurisdiction uh, as opposed to the Supreme Court. There are, uh, under the uh, Part 4 of the Property Law Act, there are um, certain limitations to the use of VCAT uh, whereby the Supreme Court only can be brought into play. Uh, one interesting point that he will touch upon, I notice in uh, reading his paper, are the implications of property arrangements between uh, 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 adults, uh, parents and their children uh, when the issue of the, um, the first home buyer's grant comes into play, 
when that operates, uh, uh, how are the interests of the property noted on title, and where does the equitable and legal benefit of the property lie? And uh, John will address that situation as part of his paper. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to John Warren. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, folks. Good to be with you. Uh, I am speaking, as uh, Tony has just explained, on uh, current issues in co-ownership disputes. Um, so the, uh, we have a regime in Victoria that was introduced in 2005, and the um, essence of the changes that were introduced at that time is that there's now uh, most co-ownership disputes are now heard and resolved in VCAT, um, whereas once upon a time uh, that was a job for the Supreme Court. Um, I'm going to be talking about co-ownership disputes uh, relating to uh, real property, uh, where the, obviously where there's no um, Family Law Act uh, issues involved. Um, everything that I, I say applies uh, just as much to uh, personal property as it does to real property. The rules are the same. Um, however, I'll, I'll be focusing on land, um, but if an issue ever arises uh, with property other than land, um, then uh, be aware that the rules are the same. Um, as Tony intimated, I think this is an area of practice that uh, could well uh, increase in uh, the quantity of disputes that are coming, uh, arising in practice and being resolved at the tribunal. And uh, I suspect, um, uh, one, I, I think that this is probably going to be driven by uh, low uh, housing affordability, uh, which has resulted in a lot of parents assisting their children to uh, purchase property. And uh, if that were not uh, reason enough for parents to help out, then um, the first homeowners grant has, uh, has made it such that there's a um, a seven thousand dollar incentive to ensure that uh, mum and dad stay off title uh, and the children go on to title. Um, families being what families are, um, disputes will arise, and uh, already the um, already there's uh, significant um, consideration over the years given to um, disputes between uh, parents and children. Uh, when it comes to beneficial ownership of property, um, I, I suspect that that's something that we'll see more and more of uh, because of what's happening uh, in the property market at the moment. Um, so, as I've said, you're, um, with a, with a co-ownership dispute, uh, your forum is VCAT. There are exceptions uh, provided in the legislation uh, that do give you the chance to go to the Supreme Court uh, should you wish to do so. Um, so uh, section 234C of the Property Law Act um, provides that the Supreme Court can hear and resolve a co-ownership matter uh, if there are, uh, you need one of two things, you need either a matter that uh, the tribunal does not have jurisdiction to hear, that's it's in the mix as well as um, a straightforward co-ownership dispute, um, or you need uh, what the legislation calls special circumstances, and that's defined uh, to include um, a case where the matter is complex. Um, so I'm going to be talking at length this morning about a recent case, case of Edelston and Birkinshaw, um, which the, pardon me, the Supreme Court decided in early August this year. And that was a, a case where there was, in addition to the co-ownership dispute, there was a dispute about um, a partnership, and or two partnerships in fact, and the um, court was asked to uh, make declarations about um, the dissolving of a partnership and also uh, to make an accounting between uh, the partners of their um, um, rights and responsibilities under the partnership. Um, so because of that partnership issue, uh, that was enough to uh, take the matter to the Supreme Court uh, rather than the tribunal. Um, the court also found that there was some complexity, although 
doesn't seem to me that the complexity was uh, above average, um, but nonetheless it was um, held to be a bit, at least a bit complex. So there you go. Um, so the parties were happy for it to be in the Supreme Court, so that's where it stayed. Um, so now that these things are heard in the tribunal rather than the Supreme Court, the um, question arises, is, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing for your clients? Um, my view is that it's a good thing. Uh, some practitioners sort of, um, uh, sort of snub their nose at the tribunal because, it, well, because it's not the Supreme Court. Um, look, the tribunal is uh, faster and it is cheaper for your clients and uh, that is um, unmistakably a good thing. Um, Obviously, the uh, standard of tribunal member is not on a par uh, with the Supreme Court, um, which is no criticism of the tribunal. It's just um, obviously the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court. Um, however, I make the points in um, paragraph seven there that um, uh, that is unlikely to adversely affect your client because um, one, most matters settle before trial. Two, um, if the member makes an error, it's just as likely to be in your favour uh, as adverse to you, um, and uh, thirdly, there's no guarantees in the Supreme Court. That, um, so uh, on balance, I think uh, putting these matters into the tribunal uh, is a good thing. Um, and uh, whilst it's not the Supreme Court, I don't, your clients don't care, they just want their remedy, um, and so that's what um, I think they're just as likely to get it uh, in the tribunal as in the, the court. Um, so I'll give you some, uh, I'll quickly go through some of the, uh, the basic rules. Um, one, there's a presumption in favour of sale. Um, section 229, I think it's headed, um, sale to be preferred. Um, so if one co-owner wants uh, the land to be sold, then uh, if you are for the other one who doesn't want that, uh, then you're going to have a, a significant task in front of you to avoid uh, the land being sold um, because there's a presumption in favour of sale. Um, usually these disputes are about what happens once, what happens to the proceeds um, once a sale occurs or uh, if a sale's imminent, uh, once it will occur. Um, there are occasions where uh, the tribunal will make an order for... Um, partition rather than sale, um, or division, sorry, to use the, uh, the language uh, that the Act currently employs. Um, now, if, you're, if you made it to this um, seminar, you're likely not practising uh, in a rural area, um, so it's unlikely that, that you are going to find um, parcels of land uh, in Melbourne uh, where a division is a practical outcome as opposed to a sale. Um, but it might happen, um, but it certainly would, would be the exception rather than the norm. Uh, there are some circumstances over the centuries where uh, courts have held that um, a sale uh, might be avoided. Um, uh, that is uh, where the property can be partitioned, uh, if the land is temporarily uh, very much depreciated in value, uh, if there's vindictiveness on uh, behalf of the plaintiff in seeking a sale. Um, and, um, I mean, these, these are things that will arise extremely rarely, but um, one that might occur is um, if one party is conducting a business from the premises, um, then the, um, the tribunal might be... Um, the presumption in favour of a sale might be um, set aside uh, in some of those circumstances. Um, so the second basic rule lay down is that the, what the tribunal has to do is come up with an outcome that's just and fair. Um, now, obviously, that gives the tribunal a very, very broad discretion uh, to make uh, whatever orders it thinks are appropriate. Uh, there are certain things that the tribunal must take into account. Um, they are... Uh, any amount that a co-owner has reasonably spent in improving the land, um, 
any costs reasonably incurred by a co-owner in the maintenance or insurance of the land, um, payment by a co-owner of more than their proportionate share of rates, mortgage repayments, purchase money, instalments or other outgoings in respect of the land, um, and damage caused by the unreasonable use of the land by a co-owner. Um, also, whether, whether or not a co-owner who has occupied the land should pay an amount equivalent to rent to a co-owner who did not occupy the land. Um, so these are things that um, must be taken into account. So if, you, um, if a client comes in with a co-ownership dispute, um, uh, go to that section, so that's um, section 233, uh, subsection 2, and get instructions on all those things. You need to know, um, you know who's lived, if it's a residence, who's lived there and for how long. Um, you need to know who paid all the rates, who paid all the outgoings, um, and, uh, and if improvements have been done. And, and often if there's... Um, uh, Often that can become quite complicated um, when you, you know, if improvement is defined broadly, it's like, well, um, you know, who paid for this and who paid for that? And 20 years ago, it was a new garage door, so I'll, I'll, we'll put that in and everything like that. So you can end up with a very long list of improvements, um, and of course all the receipts are gone, so it's um, somewhat difficult uh, to prove all that, but it's all relevant. Um, so get instructions on it um, when your client first um, raises the issue. Um, third thing, third basic rule to lay down is that um, the equitable, equitable principles um, still apply. Um, just because we've got a statutory regime, uh, that does not uh, oust uh, the jurisdiction of equity. And so there's um, all the rules that have been developed over the centuries um, about uh, you know, resulting trust, constructive trusts, um, presumption of advancement, all these things, um, they still apply, um, obviously, uh, except if there's a specific provision that runs counter uh, to it. Um, so this... Um, the tri President, Deputy President McNamara has, um, has considered this and, and concluded... And I give the authority in um, paragraph 12 that, um, that yes, these equitable principles do still apply. Um, although he, he did, like I said, he found one exception uh, to the uh, standard equitable rule. Um, and that's given in paragraph 13. Um, so, but the, the mere fact that the tribunal has to do what was just and fair... Um, does not mean that the tribunal can simply come up with whatever it wishes. Um, so uh, it was an important decision handed down by uh, Justice Sifris in the Supreme Court um, in the ex extraordinary matter of um, uh, Christchurch Grammar School in Bosnich, um, which was a, a case where a similar provision in the Fair Trading Act, which granted the tribunal the power to do what's just and fair, um, was considered, and Justice Sifris considered competing New South Wales and Victorian authority, and um, uh, un, uh, and he found that he preferred the uh, New South Wales line of authority, which said that uh, where where there is a discretion to make for the tribunal to make an order that's just and fair, um, the tribunal must apply the law, um, not merely be guided by it. Um, so, in other words, common law rules and, and equitable rules um, must be applied in the tribunal, um, not merely if it's thought it's a good idea that I apply them on this occasion. Um, so, um, Christchurch Grammar School case involved um, uh, the school suing uh, some parents for a... Their, their rule was they had a cancellation fee of uh, one term's fees, so 3200 and something dollars were on the line, and um, um, I don't know if any of you got kids at the school or anything like that, but um, the school engaged Silk and a uh, very uh, experienced junior um, to fight to get their 
$200. And uh, uh, they lost in the tribunal, um, succeeded on appeal before Justice Sifras, went back to the tribunal for the tribunal to have another think about it. And 105 paragraphs later, um, it was concluded that, yes, they did have to pay the $3,200. So um, quite, quite extraordinary. But um, uh, importantly for us, uh, it was held in the Supreme Court that um, if the tribunal has a discretion to do what is just and fair, the tribunal must apply the law. Um, so, that's, um, so those are some basic rules um, of how um, co-ownership disputes uh, work. So I want to um, talk about this recent decision of Edelston and Birkinshaw. It's not a... Um, it doesn't set the law of co-ownership on a, a brand new direction or anything like that. It's a, it's a case um, that's simply an, an example of how these things work. And so I'm going to um, tell you a bit about it and uh, make some comments on what some of the practitioners in that case did well and some of the things that, uh, that we can learn from them. Um, so in this case, uh, it's a dispute between siblings um, so about the ownership of the family farm. It's a wheat farm uh, in the Mallee, um, 8,000 acres in total, which um, I'm not from a rural background, but it certainly sounds large to me. Um, so there were three parcels, um, and the, uh, the parents first bought the land in the 1950s. Um, they had six children. Uh, as time went by, some of the children went uh, different directions, and what we ended up with at the time of this um, trial was uh, two siblings and uh, three parcels, all, th all three of which were co-owned in various um, proportions. Um, so the Supreme Court uh, heard the matter, because like I explained before, there was a partnership issue, so that's why it was in the Supreme Court rather than the tribunal. Um, Supreme Court sat in Mildura to hear it, Justice Kay um, presided. So uh, the plaintiff uh, wanted uh, the property to be sold and wanted uh, division of the proceeds. Uh, the defendant did not. The defendant wanted... Uh, the defendant argued that there was an oral agreement um, by which, all, which the co-ownership was... Uh, completely resolved uh, back in 2007. And so uh, they maintained that, no, we've, we've already got an agreement what to do and that agreement should be enforced. Um, on day three of the trial, um, the defendant abandoned that defence about the oral agreement. And um, at that point, all the, the issues in dispute uh, narrowed significantly, and uh, it was concluded that there would be uh, there would not be a sale. There would, in fact, be a division, and that uh, the court would make uh, and that of the three parcels, uh, one of them would go to one sibling, the other would go to the other sibling, and the third, which was in the middle and which was the smallest, uh, well, that was the ownership of that parcel uh, was contested. Um, so the, um, the lesson here is that if, if you have to uh, convince a court or tribunal of an oral that an oral agreement was reached, um, you have a difficult task in front of you. Um, if the paper trail does not back it up, or if, if the paper trail uh, is neutral on the point, then it's going to be very difficult um, to have uh, your argument about the oral agreement accepted. Now, I'm, I'm assuming that you, you've somehow gotten over the um, statute of frauds uh, problem, but if, if you have, it is really hard work to convince a court uh, of an oral agreement. Um, everyone's going to have different memories of the conversation. It's going to be uh, vague and unclear. So I'm not saying that uh, you can't do it, I'm just saying that you set yourself a significant task um, when you try to convince the court uh, of the contents of an oral agreement. And uh, the defendant couldn't do it, and in fact they, um, 
uh, for whatever reason, they abandoned that argument. Um, the practitioners in this case uh, appeared... It was a bit unusual in that there, was, there didn't seem to be an, any animosity between the parties. Um, and so they, uh, their relationship was described as close and harmonious, would you believe? Um, don't often get that in a co-ownership dispute. Um, uh, however, they just simply couldn't agree on who should get ownership of which, which uh, piece of land. Um, and so I guess because that, um, uh, of that good relationship that was there, that the practitioners were able to resolve quite a number of issues <laughs> along the way. So there was an uh, issue in the pleadings about an insurance policy, and uh, that got resolved and didn't, uh, didn't need to be um, decided by the court. Uh, after the orders were made, the parties agreed on an occupation <coughs> fee of a set amount um, per acre to be paid until the orders came into effect. Um, and there, there seems to be a constant effort to uh, resolve the minor issues that could be resolved, uh, even if they couldn't do the whole lot. And uh, I think this shows that you do, you do your client a great service if you can resolve peripheral issues um, without requiring the court or the tribunal to do that. Um, it's amazing how, a, in litigation, how a peripheral issue can just um, get a life of its own and, and sort of come to dominate um, the, the trial or the hearing. Um, and it's just, um, if you can get those things out of the way, then that's, uh, that's a really good outcome for your clients. It's always worth ha having a mediation, even if, even if you know that um, you know, the main dispute might not be able to resolve, but if you can knock off some of the minor things on the side, then that's still a very useful mediation if it, if it achieves that outcome. Um, so, um, uh, so that's something that uh, was done very well in this case. The um, court faced the task of working out uh, the value of the three parcels. And so everyone uh, gave evidence as to what they thought, uh, you know, which parcel was uh, the best and, you know, the condition of the soil here. And they even got uh, Mum to come down from Mildura. Oh, no, sorry, it was in Mildura. Um, they even got Mum to come in and give evidence. And she said, oh, yeah, well, once a, one year we had a really good, got 12 bags an acre out of... Um, that lot over there, a really good year that was. And all of that evidence as to the value of the um, three parcels of land um, was totally ignored uh, because in addition to all that, an expert valuer said, um, it's all worth this much, bom, 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 bom. And that evidence was accepted um, without question, without hesitation. Um, so if you're going to argue, if you've got an ar a dispute about what the value is of a piece of land, just get an expert valuer um, to do it, and there's and that evidence will be preferred over um, everyone else's ideas about um, what it might be worth. Um, so that's um, so d yeah. So don't expect anything else to be taken seriously. If an expert valuer says um, X, then the only way that the court will conclude other than X is if a different expert valuer says Y, um, and then. The uh, they'll have to work it out. Um, so the outcome of the case was that um, of the, the three parcels, uh, uh, one was given to one sibling, the other was given uh, to the other sibling. The third parcel, as I said, was um, uh, that was really where the contest ended up being fought, and uh, that was given to the defendant, um, who, in the opinion of the court, was... Um, best able to make use of it um, because they were uh, really the driving force behind the um, <coughs> operation of the farm at the time of the, at the, time of the trial. Um, the other sibling uh, had uh, sort of moved away uh, to Mildura and uh, uh, was coming and going but wasn't, um, uh, certainly wasn't the driving force behind the productive use of the farm. So... Um, um, the plaintiff uh, wanted, uh, was happy for co-ownership to remain uh, for, for some of the land, um, but the court held that 
if that occurred, then it would just cause more problems in the future. And so the best outcome would be um, to end the relationship as co-owners uh, between the siblings. And um, so essentially the, uh, the defendant uh, got what they wanted in terms of the, the final outcome once they'd uh, abandoned their um, argument about an oral agreement. Um, so the, um, the lesson is that the, a court and tribunal will reach a common sense uh, conclusion uh, in these matters. And so the, um, the court also ordered that uh, the defendant who got the ownership of the um, third parcel uh, had to pay a fee uh, to, the, to the plaintiff such that uh, financially the outcomes were identical um, once the uh, value as evidence had been taken into account. So they ended up with, uh, in the same financial position, but the ownership went to the um, person best able to make productive use of the land. Um, so that was um, Edelston and Birkenshaw. Um, I thought I would also um, quickly make mention of a recent uh, High Court case, which is technically on um, uh, trust law rather than co-ownership, although it... Um, uh, it possibly could have been uh, brought to VCAT mm -hmm. under Part 4 of the Property Law Act um, if the facts arose in Victoria. But it was a South Australian case. Um, Burns and Kendall also handed down in the first week of August. Um, so in this case, uh, there was an elderly couple, they... Um, met and married when they were about 60, uh, they had children from previous marriages, they separated when they were about 80, and um, the husband was on title alone, um, but the, um, the, the son of the wife uh, was a solicitor and he was very active in ensuring that um, his, mother, his mother had a beneficial interest in the property, so uh, he was active in ensuring that was protected, and so the uh, husband signed a declaration of trust um, saying that he held half his interest in the property on trust uh, for his wife. And the, the main issue in dispute was whether, as trustee, he therefore had an occupation to get a commercial uh, rate of rent from the property because after they separated, he remained on title. But they didn't live in the property anymore. So the husband let the property to uh, his son. And... Um, uh, son paid two weeks of rent and then got the next six years free. Um, and it was held that, that that was a breach of trust. He did have to, uh, had to um, collect a commercial rate of rent. So that's all uh, taken care of under our statute um, about occupation. Um, but it was, uh, I've said in the paper, it's a, um, a ridiculous out... There was an extremely small amount of money on the line. So um, he had the glory of winning in the High Court. Um, and then he faced a bill which I uh, can't imagine. So um, I will hand back to Tony. Thank you, folks. Thank you, John. Can I just make a number of a couple of comments on John's excellent paper and his dissertation on the paper? Um, as a me member of the bar in excess of thirty years, and having appeared in VCAT and its and its uh, its previous uh, tribunals, um, AAT, uh, Planning Appeals Board Division, um, uh, all sorts of names have been accorded to it. And currently being a sessional member of VCAT, can I say to you as solicitors in this field of law, where the issues are invariably difficult and where there's a lot of money involved and the stakes are very high, do everything in your power to avoid going to VCAT. Um, I'm serious about that. There's this, uh, there's this creeping approach of the government to, and maybe the judge of the Supreme Court are partly responsible, of, of uh, devolving as much as they can to VCAT. In some cases it works, perhaps in the planning division where I often appear, although last week in a case I was just horrified at the quality of the tribunal. But in, a, in situations involving property law uh, and issues of what are called complexity, I see no, footnote 3 on page 2, section 234, uppercase C5A of the Act, uh, do what you can to drive a horse and dray 
uh, through the complexity issue because uh, the members of the tribunal, and one significant uh, um, uh, exception to that is the member uh, who um, John's referred to in a number of positions, that's uh, uh, Michael McNamara, who's a deputy president of, of, of excellent intellect and, and analysis. Uh, the tribunal just isn't up to it. Uh, uh, you, you could have some, and we heard a couple of examples from John where matters went to VCAT, uh, they got it wrong, it goes to the Supreme Court and uh, scores maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars later, it ends up in VCAT uh, and uh, you're in no better position. Uh, in my view, stay away from the place. The other thing about it is that Section 98 enables VCAT to uh, uh, throw the rules of, of evidence out the window, it can decide cases uh, in accordance with what it thinks uh, just without regard to the rules of evidence. And let me tell you, under the guise of that particular provision, uh, they do some terrible things. So uh, when you've got a case involving a resulting trust, a constructive trust, um, uh, or any matter of complexity, or where you can have uh, an element of the action that, uh, that may not have jurisdiction uh, granted to VCAT, take advantage of that. Um, it's only in the simplest of cases that I'd give that over to, um, to VCAT. Um, the case of Edelson, Burke and Shaw, which I've read, is, is an ornament, as, as you'd expect, with Stephen Kay as the judge. I, I recommend you read that uh, as an excellent uh, dissertation on the law and the facts in relation to constructive, constructive trusts. Uh, and uh, there's another constructive cus, uh, trust case uh, which you ought to read uh, on, the, on the issue of um, interest in property, and that's a case of Donis, D-O-N-I-S and Donis, the judgment of His Honour Justice uh, Nettle on appeal, 2007 VR, I'm not sure of the page, but that, that really is uh, uh, an excellent judgment to follow. Thank you.